This is Action Smash the Demolition. With Steve and the Scum. Every week, WGD Weekly. We listen to it, you should too. You better, we're gonna check your stick and take that. Oh boy, Scum, I'll tell you what, I really miss that music. Scum Nation! All you savages out there, we are back. Welcome to Wrestling's Glory Days Weekly Podcast, WGD Weekly with Steve and the Scum. My name is Steve. Alongside me this week is the Scum. We're back. We have a special two-part episode with J.J. Dillon, WWE Hall of Famer, and correct me if I'm wrong, Scum, the leader of the Four Horsemen. We're going to find out what happened to Tully Blanchard Enterprises. We're going to hear some great stories about the Four Horsemen and also a three-decade career by J.J. Dillon. He wrestled in over 3,000 matches, so it's going to be great to hear from him next week, part two of J.J. Dillon, so check that out on iTunes and follow us at WGD Weekly. Following that scum, I'm going to tell us tell our listeners one more guest, and I'm going to flip it over to you, my man, to give us the big payoff at the end. Two weeks of J.J. Dillon, followed by Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff and Scum. I just wanted to say real quickly, we were gone for two weeks, actually three weeks. I went and got myself married. There's a Mrs. Steve Savage amongst us now. Andy's great. I'm so happy that everybody was able to attend, especially you, my man. You were my best man. That speech was awesome. It's never something I'm never going to forget. Welcome back to the show, my brother. How you been? Steve, is that you? That's me, my man. I I, I bar- barely recognize your voice. It's been so long, my friend. But <laughs> like I always say, if I could kind of uh, make an analogy here, it's almost like I've been crawling over to the corner, and each time someone distracts the referee when I make the tag, and then they're pushing you back out, and they just keep beating the shit out of me here, man. Oh, uh, uh, you're selling. I, you're selling. I think I finally have got over and uh, psyched the crowd up and made that hot tag. It's, it's always a pleasure to be back here with you, my uh, longtime tag team partner on Wrestling's Glory Days Weekly. And, uh, yeah, it was great. I, I was honored to be a part of the big wedding. Uh wasn't exactly like the old... Uh, segment on raw when triple h drove stephanie through the uh drive through and got married and showed mr mcmahon up on the titan tron <laughs> but it it was it was quite an event um and like i said I, I was honored to be there and i'm really happy to see two of my favorite people two of my best friends you know join together and uh i'm also really happy to get back into things here with uh james j Dillon, like you said the leader of the four horsemen as he um as you'll see, he was sure to tell us, not the manager, uh, the man who at one point was the, let's call him the COO of Tully Blanchard Enterprises. <laughs> uh, great to be great. We got some fantastic stuff. What a career. Uh, two hours plus of interview time. We're going to have it in two segments. Like you said, uh, main eventer from WrestleMania 1, uh, Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff, WWE Hall of Famer coming up. Uh, we got also just great things coming as we head into the home stretch here for Season 2 of Wrestling's Glory Days Weekly. Uh, one of our all-time favorites, a guy that I'm sure we'll touch on, much like we do with JJ and all of our guys who are involved, one of the people in the first War Games, uh, legendary figure in the uh, Jim Crockett promotions and in the old NWA, Steve, we got the Russian nightmare, Nikita Koloff up on the horizon as we head into the last few shows, the final five shows of season two. And then an extremely special one year anniversary wrapping up season uh, two here with, from what I am pretty sure is a fair statement reuniting two old friends the reuniting of jim Cornette and kevin sullivan will both be joining steven the scum in what is an absolute can't miss capper to the season of wgd weekly with steven the scum oh I, i cannot wait to broadcast that and share it with all of our listeners it's in the bag do not miss this i've said that before and we've never failed you guys when we say do not miss this episode it's got some great content you're not going to believe the conversation and where it went scum i'll be honest with you my man you and i didn't really do much other than hit the record button and let those two great wrestling minds just have at it and talk about some really interesting stuff so you like you said it's going to be a fantastic way to cap off season two i can't wait a lot of things down the pike though I, i tell you we're like a couple of blacksmiths we got so many irons in the fire 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, as as we get closer to the end of the season, we'll be able to uh, divulge a little more information here to uh, Scum Nation, to the WGD faithful, the savages, as you like to call them, my friend. Uh, but again, you're going to want to stay tuned these last five episodes because the reason that we are heading out of season two is because there is an extremely big venture that Steve and the Scum have been, are going to be a part of. It involves a third party as we move forward with the show and that's about all that we can let on to right now until a uh, few more eyes are dotted a few more t's are crossed but trust me it's the biggest news that we've had yet it's going to change the whole landscape of wrestling's glory days weekly as we know it it's going to change the whole landscape of wrestling podcasting it's going to play into what i've said all along and it's going to play into steve the scum and this third party completely in a whole new vein, becoming the latest sensation that's sweeping the wrestling podcast nation. And uh, again, there's not much more we can say about it, Steve. I know that we got, we want to get, uh, come in as quick as we can here and bring everyone James J. Dillon. So that's all I have to add now. Um, as far, unless you have anything to add to it, my friend, uh, let's get right into it with, uh, JJ. I, I, I don't really have much to lead in with other than, I wanted to make sure everybody knows in a day and age of modern wrestling where you have uh, uh, factions, you have the Shield, you have the Wyatts, before the Shield, before the Wyatts, before DX, before the NWO, there were the Four Horsemen. And the leader of the Four Horsemen was indeed James J. Dillon, a great wrestling mind, very well spoken. So stay tuned, folks. J.J. Dillon, right after this. This is D'Lo Brown. You better recognize whenever I want the best in pro wrestling, all I gotta do is turn the Glory Days Weekly with my boy Steve and, oh yeah, my dog the scum. You know, recognize that. All right, folks, welcome back. It's that time we have J.J. Dillon with us. He is the author of the book, Wrestlers Are Like Seagulls. Go to jjdillon.com and order yourself a copy there. Leader of the Four Horsemen, two-time Hall of Famer, James J. Dillon is with us. Thanks so much for joining us, JJ. How you doing tonight? I'm doing great. And you? I'm doing fine tonight, thank you. You know, I think our listeners this week are in for a real history lesson uh, with you joining us. So many things to discuss, but we wanted to go back to the beginnings of your career in the world of professional wrestling. Talk to us a little bit about how you got interested in even getting into the business to begin with. And tell us of the story about your being the president of a certain performer's fan club uh, long before you ever stepped in the squared circle. <laughs> well, I, I did. I started as a fan. Uh, I was born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey, and uh, actually was a big baseball fan, too, Brooklyn Dodger fan. And they uh, they up and pulled stakes and moved to the West Coast and uh, I, meanwhile, discovered live wrestling that was on one night a week every Thursday night uh, from the Capitol Arena in Washington, D.C., and, boy, I I just I became addicted. And when they finally came around uh, and had a live event uh, in my hometown at the uh, Armory in Trenton, New Jersey, and I went, and I believe I saw Argentina Rocca and Carl Von Hess, uh, all these characters that I had watched on a black-and-white television now we're we're coming to the to life and in, in true color and just the atmosphere and it was the era of uh chief big heart and haystacks calhoun dr jerry graham and eddie graham and skull murphy brute bernard killer kowalski the sheik i mean just a, a diverse set of characters and they, they were bigger than life and at that time uh, you didn't see people walking around with Indian headdresses or their, or their head shaved bald or uh, Carl Von Hess with the tattoos all over them. Nowadays, uh, you can walk down in any small town and, and you wouldn't even turn your head to see uh, somebody like that. But back in that day, uh, bleach blonde hair, I mean, they just were bigger than life characters. And the one, is, uh, as you alluded to, that really stood out for, for me was Johnny Valentine. And and at that point, uh, of course, way before I ever got into the business, uh, there just was something about him that um, was special. And I came to find out later on as I got into the business uh, how really talented he was and the reputation that he held. So, um, you know, I started a fan club for him and, uh, you know, got to know him somewhat on a personal level and, 
just was really in awe of uh, uh, of everything that he did in the ring. One of the statements that that I hear attributed to him, you know, people always have always talked about, you know, is wrestling real or isn't it real? That question has been asked back as far as uh, I can ever remember. And I don't know the exact verbiage, but supposedly Johnny Valentine said, well, there's nothing that I can do to convince you one way or the other that wrestling is real, but I can convince you that Johnny Valentine's real. <laughs> and and he did, much like Wahoo Me Daniels and a lot of others that came along behind him, that he would lean guys over the ropes and, and just uh, smash them and the sweat would fly and blood blisters and welts and uh he made a believer out of me very good well you certainly from that beginning you've done it all in the world of pro wrestling wore many hats let's say during your time in the wrestling business and i think everyone that would be listening in is familiar with your time as a manager as a wrestler and even working behind the scenes in the different companies and many different capacities that we'll touch on moving along Uh, one position that some might not know was that you spent some time as a referee uh, in the WWWF when it was run by Vince McMahon Sr. Uh, tell us, if you would, uh, how you wind up wearing the stripes up there, some memories of that time, and then being that the last name is actually included as part of the title of your autobiography, uh, could you recall for us your thoughts on Vince Sr. from what you got to know of him? Well, I, you know, it was my dream to, to be, become a professional wrestler. And actually, an old-timer named uh, the original Zebra Kid, George Bolas, was somebody that I approached one time and and as many professional wrestlers are asked by young people and this was now back in the era where there were no such thing as wrestling schools or places where people could go to train there was no uh uh no easy route to get into the business it's very difficult to, to get into the break into the profession and i asked the the george bolus you know if he had any advice for me and he gave me two pieces of advice that uh, I took seriously and, and pass along half a century later to young people when I'm ever asked. And the first thing he told me was to get my education first. Uh, he said, get that college diploma. And he said, even if you don't, immediately put it to use and just have it sitting there in your back pocket. Uh, professional wrestling is like a lot of other things in life. There's a lot of uncertainties. You maybe make it, maybe you don't make it. Uh, the injury factor, what have you, and if you have that education to fall back on, that's something that once you have it, they can't take it away from you. And the other thing that he said was learn the fundamentals, the basics of amateur wrestling. Uh, And you will find that uh, even though professional wrestling is viewed differently than amateur wrestling, the fundamentals uh, apply. And that was good advice, too. I guess I did. I never really answered the question. I, I hung around uh, the matches, and uh, back in those days, uh, they used to do uh, a uh, weekly show in Philadelphia that they taped at the NBC studio for an hour, and they would air it on Saturday, and it was really aimed directly at the one big show that they had a month that was promoted by Ray Fabiani, the local promoter who was also the president of the Philadelphia Lyric Opera Society and a very refined gentleman. But uh, the matches were, the TV matches were held in the basement of the NBC studio. And it was like a real small, small theater and the ring was up on the stage. And I was attending college at that point. Uh, I went to Albright College in Reading, Pennsylvania. And the guy that set the ring up came from Reading. They would take it out of storage, set it up and, uh, I would ride down with him, and we'd put a T-shirt on, and he, you know, he'd take the ring jackets in one corner, and I'd take them in the opposite corner for the actual show. And so, you know, that was my few seconds of fame on television. But uh, a blizzard hit there one uh, one week that that came in late in the day, and we were already there set up, and enough of the wrestlers got there to actually be able to tape an hour show. But the commission, the referees were assigned by the State Athletic Commission, and none of the referees showed up. So that was uh, a situation just being the right place at the right time, and they'd seen me hanging around, and they're looking for somebody to referee, and uh, everybody just kind of looked at me, and they said, can you do it? And I said, yes. And uh, I really wasn't given much in the way of instructions. Uh, uh, I was just told that the camera really shoots from the one angle, and 
you just uh, walk around three sides of the ring. At no point do you want to see your uh, your keister, your rear end, uh, walk in front of that camera. And that was pretty much all they told me. And I refereed the entire hour, and just instinctively from from being a fan and 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 being around the business, I just you know knew what to do and did a good job. And and then I was ultimately added to the commission in Pennsylvania. Willie Gilsenberg came from New Jersey who was the president of the WWF at that time, saw me uh, uh, referee and talked to Vince McMahon Sr., who used to come to most of the, if not every big show in Philadelphia, and you know knew me on a first-name basis, always said hello to me, was very, very kind to me when I was basically a nobody, just a kid in college, and uh, very friendly towards me. He was extremely well-respected by everybody in the business, and you know, he said some things to Willie Gilsenberg. Next thing I know, I'm on the commission in, in New Jersey, too. And um, I, I was graduated from college, got got married, uh, had a child. And, and you know, I thought, boy, here's my dream is gone now. And so far, I was actually a referee on a part-time basis for eight years. And the sheik from Detroit came in and just casual conversation in the dressing room told him one day that uh, my dream really was to to be a wrestler and he said well i promote in detroit you come out there and you put the tights on and, and we'll, we'll see what you can do and that's that's how that happened fascinating so another legend of the business the sheet gives you the opportunity to go and get some time spent in the ring we're with jj dillon here at wgd weekly jj did he actually get in the ring with you for some formal training or was there anybody else responsible for kind of showing you the ropes no, not not really. Actually, uh, in New Jersey at the time, they didn't have any amateur wrestling, so I never even saw an amateur ma- match until I went to college. And I went with the idea of mine, as George Bolas had recommended, getting a degree. It was a small school, went out for the wrestling team, made the wrestling team, and saw my first amateur match and learned the fundamentals. But I had uh, played judo for three years before that, so I understood – balance, leverage, uh, uh, being able to protect myself, uh, you know, for judo throws and, and what have you, and all of that came into play. But really, my my greatest education came from being third man in the ring for much of the reign of the, the great legendary Bruno Sammartino and being uh, the referee for many of his title matches against uh, – the greats of that era from Gorilla Monsoon to Killer Kowalski to uh, Professor Tanaka to Georgie Animal Steel, where I'm in the ring just uh, a feet feet away from them to to see and observe what they did and and the reactions of the of the fans and uh, that was my learning curve and you know occasionally in the dressing room I remember Al Costello, one of the original Kangaroos, you know one time just. Come here, kid. He said, Dude, you now lock up? Show me how you lock up. You know, And I, I went to lock up, and I remember I put my head down thinking, I don't know what I was thinking. And, of course, he said, that's the first thing that you're doing wrong right there. And, and he said, do you understand why? And I said, no. And he said, well, the minute that you put your head down and come in, he said, the first thing that's going to happen, if I did the same thing, we're going to crack each other's heads. So, you put your head up so you can see my eyes, I can see your eyes and what you're doing. And, and he locked up with me in, in the, uh, in the dressing room. And that's how I learned. And then when I went to wrestle for the Sheik, it was just a, a weekend deal. Uh, I had two tag match, a couple of tag matches and my first single match, uh, of my career was in Pittsburgh on TV against the legendary killer Kowalski. So, that's also something I'm very proud of that uh, that's who I had my first single match with. And I went back a year later and wrestled for the whole week for the Sheik. And uh, a couple nights uh, I was against uh, Pedro Godoy, who was an old timer. And and it was uh, not a TV match, so you had more time and not the same kind of pressure and a, and a chance to maybe do some other things that you wouldn't otherwise on TV. And I remember at one point uh, I was in position. He wanted me to slam him, and I had never slammed anybody. And I picked him up and just didn't have control of him, nearly dropped him on his head. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, we get back to the dressing room after the match. This guy is going to want to kill me. 
And um, got back to the dressing room, and, and he called me over, and I thought, I don't know if I'm going to have to fight for my life or what. And he, and he said, slam me and showed me there. He said, pick me up. And as I went to pick me up, pick him up, he, he you know, he kind of demonstrated how uh, you need to get low. And it, again, it was all balanced by taking his weight against my chest and my upper body. And it was unbelievable how easy he went up and how I was able just with a little bit of instruction to control his balance. And then he said that once you're up here, he said, all you're doing is turning me over and gravity takes care of the rest of it. And of course I wrestled him like for three nights and the next night, uh, the, one of the first moves of the match was in a position to slam him and boom, did it, uh, textbooks, uh, uh, body slam. And, and that did so much for my confidence, but that was my learning curve. Well, geez, those names that you dropped there, <laughs> learning by watching. I mean, the Bruno and Monsoon and Tanaka and George Steele, and then having your first match with Killer Kowalski. I can't really uh, think of any bigger names or legendary names in the business than that. That's and the a- week where I wrestled uh, Pedro Godoy, the main event around that week, was uh, Killer Carl Cox and Mark Lewin, two oh, wow. of the truly, truly great, great, uh, professionals in the business, both of whom uh, you know, I was a lot. I spent a lot of time around Carl Cox, uh, especially in Amarillo, and wrestled Mark Lewin virtually all over the world. He was he, he really true, one, truly one of the all-time greats. It really started as a young kid and was teamed with uh, Don Curtis when I first started uh, started wrestling. They were one of the one of the top teams. So. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna write a follow up to my autobiography uh, in another year or two. I got kids in college and I'm still working full time. And and when the kids get out, I'm I I kept ledgers that enabled me to write my autobiography. Wrestlers are like seagulls. It was kind of like a a diary that I could refer back to. That I kept those little weekly week at a glance journals. They still make them. And that's how I would write where what town I was in every night and whether I drove the mileage and if I stayed over the expenses. And I would tally all that at the end of the year uh, because you were self-employed and to be able to to do my income taxes. And But each day where I would write down where I was, I wrote down the match that I was in and, and you know, one loss, whatever. And so that was from the very beginning of my career and I threw them in a box and just somehow career saved them. So I've gone back through them. And as you mentioned, I'm best remembered as, as a manager, as leader of the four horsemen, but a lot of people were surprised to find out that I had over 3,200 professional matches in my career. And as I look back through those journals and have made a list of the, of the people that I've been in the ring with, uh, it's like the who's who of wrestling, and and some of them might only been one time or two times, but um, I think it's going to make for interesting reading and a, and a good sequel to my my lifetime story, my autobiography. JJ's autobiography, uh, wrestlers are like seagulls. Certainly a good read. I, I'm sure everyone can't wait to see that the next chapter of it when you get a chance to do that sequel. Uh, funny you brought up Mark Lewin. We recently had Kevin Sullivan on the show, and. He he gave us he listed his top five heels in the business of all time, and he spoke extensively about Mark Lewin when he was talking about when he was on the program. And uh, so we've heard quite a bit about him lately, actually a lot a lot of praise for him. But uh, anyway, moving along with your time as an in ring worker, and you were saying you know with your diaries that you kept a who's who of talent that you were in the ring with, you were also pretty much everywhere that you could be as far as the territories went when you were saying, I don't know if you just said somewhere a few thousand matches or whatever. So, I mean, you stopped, you touched on the Northeast, Detroit. Uh, You had some time in Charlotte, Georgia, Florida, Texas, you know, up in Canada, Japan, Europe, and on and on. So uh, bringing us back, what were your personal, your favorite stops or territories to work and maybe some of the – if you can look back at some of those competitors, um, and not necessarily the biggest names, but that you enjoyed working with during your run in the ring. 
Well, I, I, when I first started, of course, my goal was just to, to become a wrestler, to get my foot in the in the door. And I remember in the beginning, uh, as a referee, I I used to just at nighttime pinch myself because myself because here I am a referee four matches with Haystack Calhoun, Bobo Brazil, uh all of these legends that that I had actually seen in Madison Square Garden and, and other arenas. Now I'm in the ring uh refereeing their matches. Then once I broke into the business, now I find myself in the ring actually wrestling Haystack Calhoun. Bobo Brazil, The Sheik, Killer Kowalski, and the names go on and on and on. So, I mean, it's like it was almost surreal. And I started in the Northeast, which was really because that's how television was in those days. The the Capitol Arena in Washington, D.C. was mainly the, the vehicle by which they promoted live events from as far south as Washington, D.C., up to the tip of Maine, out as far as Pittsburgh. So you had all those major population centers, uh, Baltimore, Philly, Pittsburgh, Washington, Boston, uh, on and on and on. And then, of course, when you say to any wrestling fan anywhere in the world, when you when you say the Garden, uh, yes, there is a Boston Garden. Yes, there's a Cincinnati Gardens. There is a Maple Leaf Garden in Toronto. There's a, but when you just say the Garden, every wrestling fan knows you're talking about the Mecca, and that's Madison Square Garden in New York. So I wanted to just get my foot in the door, and once I was there, I thought, well, I've kind of got a bucket list of three things that are kind of what are going to be my measuring stick where I can say, okay, not only did I become a wrestler, but I kind of made it to a level that I wanted to to get to. And the big stars in those days had wrestled in Australia, and this goes back to when, of course, Jim Barnett had a phenomenal promotion over there. And and I did eventually go to Australia and wrestle there for a year, even though it was after Barnett was gone and it wasn't quite what it was back in the glory days. But it was a fabulous place to to live and uh, and to wrestle. Uh, Japan was the other one. And when I went and worked Amarillo, which my – I started in Charlotte, North Carolina. So that was a transition from what I was accustomed to uh, in the New York area with these these big mega shows mainly every three weeks. And they, they would run smaller arenas, but uh, all the hype was, was, uh, was the big major population centers that they would have big events every three or four weeks. And in Charlotte, uh, it was primarily smaller venues, and weekly talent, weekly promotions. So that was a, a big, big change for me. And when I got there, uh, you know, there were a handful of guys that I knew, but by and large, most of them I had never heard of. Uh, in general, uh, they they weren't bigger than life, as I kind of remembered most of the guys uh, in the New York area. But the it was a different style of wrestling and the level of talent was equal but just measured in a different way and i loved it there i loved it in charlotte i stayed two and a half years uh dory funk was the nwa world heavyweight champion to me bruno sammartino had been the champion and now i find out that uh, crock promotions is part of the national wrestling alliance and that there are like 25 territories, regional territories all around the country, as well as Japan uh, and other parts of uh, of the world that were had memberships. They all recognized a single champion, and I had a chance. Uh, my, I was there for two years, and and thanks to Johnny Weaver, who was one of the guys that was wonderful to me, uh, I actually had a chance to uh, challenge Dory Funk for the for the NWA World's title um my second year in the business and to me that was an incredible incredible honor and um I stayed mostly in the south from there I uh, I I did get my break up in the Canadian Maritimes and I had met Dory uh, in Charlotte Terry came in for a big show like when they would run Greensboro 
Coliseum or what have you, and Dory would come in to defend the title. If they had a really big show, uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving were, were big days for, for special shows. But I remember one in particular in Greensboro where Dory defended the title. Terry came in and Dory Sr. came in. And they asked me to come down early to uh, Greensboro and come by the hotel so I could meet Sr., and I think they wanted to make the pitch to me that, you know, when I was done there, they had hoped that I would go to uh, uh, to Amarillo, that they felt that I would do extremely well there. And uh, one of their selling points was the fact that they had a working agreement with All Japan Wrestling and Giant Baba that pretty much assured you an opportunity to go to Japan. So uh, that's where I went after the Maritimes. I ended up with two jo- tours of Japan and one of my one of my first tours of Japan, uh, of course, Giant Baba I had seen in Madison Square Garden. Uh, the Destroyer was uh, legendary over there. And one of the tours that I was on was Dory Funk, Terry Funk, Jack Briscoe, Jerry Briscoe, and Harley Race for part of that tour along wow. with, like I say, Baba and... Uh, uh, and and the destroyer. And as I think back, if if you had a magic wand and wanted to, from that era to put together a, a group of guys to be on tour, uh, you couldn't have picked uh, any better names. And the, and the, to think that I was there and part of that was, uh, you know, again one of those very special memories that I have. And and Japan, to answer your question, uh, was I think my favorite place in the world to go. And a lot of it has to do with. Uh, the culture uh, being so different than us and tremendous respect. They respected you as a professional. You were a professional wrestler in Japan. You you were highly respected. The profession was respected. And every, it, the people of Japan respected authority. Um, you, you saw it much, much later with the, the disaster over there and the tsunami that wiped out villages. Uh, unlike a lot of other places in the world, you you didn't hear about looting, and it was one of those things where the people just uh, uh, helped each other. They're very stoic, very loyal, very honest, and uh, probably my favorite place in the world to go was there in Japan. Wow, what a superstar lineup to have worked with in Japan there. Now, we go from Japan back to New York City. You had the opportunity in your career to referee several matches in Madison Square Garden, But not until 1984 did you have the opportunity to actually wrestle a match there. So take us through that. Talk to us about wrestling your first match ever in Madison Square Garden. And also at the same time, your career kind of took a turn towards that managerial role. So tell us a little bit about who were some of your early favorites to manage. Now, we're going to get into the Four Horsemen here in just a little bit. But before the Four Horsemen, you had the opportunity to manage as well. So tell us who you enjoyed managing at that point. And, of course, talk us through that opportunity to wrestle your first match in Madison Square Garden. Well, my, my bucket list that I got back to was actually three things. Uh, going to tour Japan, as all the greats had done, was one thing. Going to Australia was the other. But really at the top of my list was to someday myself wrestle in Madison Square Garden, where I'd gone as a kid to see all these greats. And um, it was much later on I was uh, – uh, working in the office in Florida in the early 80s, uh, I actually wrestled, I started wrestling in 71, and I wrestled full-time for about five years. And when I was in the Maritimes, I met Archie Goldie, the Mongolian stomper. Uh, from there, I left, went to Amarillo, two tours of Japan, was there for over a year. And then the Funks uh, uh, set me up to go from there to Florida. And of course, Eddie Graham owned the promotion. I had seen Eddie Graham countless times in Madison Square Garden. I knew his reputation for being, uh, you know, one of the great minds in the business. So I was, and actually I had gone there for a weekend. Uh, Johnny Weaver had sent me out just to get some exposure. And so the thought of going and wrestling in Florida was uh, uh, was something I was very excited about. And uh, I was Florida Tag Team Champion with uh, Roger Kirby for a run. I was Florida Television Champion for a while. And Archie Goldie was was wrestling in Florida at the same time. In fact, he and I teamed up a few times. And 
Uh, Stomper left there, went to Tennessee with Bearcat Wright as his manager, and, and that was not a marriage made in heaven. It was oil and water. And, and I was wrestling in, in Florida, and I got a phone call out of the blue one day, and here it was, uh, the Stomper. And he said, I'm in Tennessee. This thing with Bearcat was a disaster. I've got to get out of here. And I've been on the phone, and I've got a main event spot in Dallas uh, with Fritz von Erich, and but I need a manager. And asked me if I'd ever given any thought to, to, to being a manager, which I hadn't. And he said, uh, uh, your interviews, uh, you know, he was fascinated always by my interviews. And he said, I, I just think we would be a, a – a natural combination and and so uh again uh, my career has always been one of just things come up when you least expect them and i uh was very happy in florida i had done well and just decided to say okay i'm gonna go and so i left went to dallas and started managing towards the end of 1975 uh the mongolian stopper and again archie uh he was he was a great great talent, and but sometimes he could be his own worst enemy. He had little things that would get to him, nothing between him and I, but something wouldn't go exactly to his liking, and he would think that uh, oh they they're not behind me, they're not going to push me, and, and it was not unlike him just in the middle of the night to pack everything, no notice, and be gone, and he would go back to Calgary where Stu would always welcome him with open arms because he drew a lot of money there and. Um, I ended up, because they had a lot invested in me, they asked me to stay in Dallas, and they gave me uh, Moondog, Maine. And um, so I had a, a nice run in Dallas. And, uh, again, got another phone call from, from uh, Archie, and he said, geez, I, I, he apologized. I was wrong. We had such a good thing going, and we ended up going from – he said, I've I've got two officers, offers. He said one with Vern Gagne in Minneapolis and the other with Jim Barnett in Atlanta. And so I said, all right, then we, you know, we had a good thing going, and I'd be willing to, to go either place. And it ended up uh, – I got a phone call back from Archie. And he said, I made a commitment. We're going to Atlanta with Jim Barnett. Got a good spot. And the next day, I got a phone call from Vern Gagne and trying to convince me to come to Minneapolis. And I told him, I said, uh, I would dream of, of someday being in Minneapolis. But I said, right now, I gave my word. And uh, that's one thing I've always taken great pride in, that I'm a man of my word, and it's not a question of playing one against the other, and I don't think Vern was very happy with that decision, And but I, I ended up going to Atlanta. So over the years, I managed uh, Archie. I managed Abdullah the Butcher because Archie left again in Atlanta, the big John Stud, Toro Tanaka. Uh, in fact, if you look at the, the jacket of my autobiography, uh, Scott Teal has built a mosaic in there of uh, uh, a lot of the different guys that uh, that I managed, and uh, I ended up uh, when I went to Charlotte uh, the second time around. Uh, I wrestled, I I, I managed uh, gorgeous Jimmy Garvin uh, in Florida, and that was in '84. And I was wrestling and I was managing both at the same time. I kind of made that transition. I, I think I was King James at the time. Um, and I wore a robe and had talked to Jerry Lawler and he gave his blessing for me to get a crown. I said, I'm not, I'm not stealing Jerry the King Lawler. I'm just, my name is James and King James just sounds natural, just something different. And uh, Eddie Graham came into the office one day and which he would often do. I, I was working in the office and I, you know, just reminiscent about all those times that I'd gone to see him in the garden, and I said I dreamed one day that uh, that maybe someday I could wrestle in Madison Square Garden too. But this is 1984. I broke in in '71, uh, and when I broke in, I was almost I was 28, close to 29 years old. So I started very late. And Father Time was not on my side, and I thought, well, the thing with Madison Square Garden would would probably never happen. And Eddie never said anything. He got up and walked out, and 
uh, a day or so went by, and Eddie walked back in one day, and he said, you are booked on the next card in Madison Square Garden. He said, they were going to send you a plane ticket. You will fly up. You will be on the card, and then you will fly back. And uh, he had, after that conversation, called Vince McMahon Sr., who remembered me. And at the time, it was right when uh, Vince Jr. was kind of declaring war against everybody and taking over. The father was a very heavy smoker and very, very sick at the time uh, uh, with with lung cancer. And, in fact, he passed away very shortly after that. But I called him. Uh, he, he used to have a place during the summer up here near me in Rehoboth Beach. And then in the winter, he would stay in Fort Lauderdale. And I called him to thank him. And uh, he, he basically told me the same thing that he told Eddie, that he remembered me fondly and, and being the being that I had this dream, he, you know, just wanted to make it happen. And so uh, I, I still have a copy of the program up on my wall that I'm looking at on Monday, uh, April 23rd of 1984. And uh, I went up there and they juggled the card around because they taped for the Garden Network at that time. And I ended up wrestling Tito Santana, who was the Intercontinental Champion at the time. Wow, that's great. That is great. What what a, how speaks a lot for uh, Vince Senior and what a guy he was during oh, that. Yes, yep, that yep. And you know what's interesting too is I look at that card uh, because I I tried to get a program that night and they were sold out and I since was able to get a copy and someone made a photocopy of the program insert with all the matches and on that night in 1984 the main event was Sergeant Slaughter and the Iron Sheik. And, and underneath that was Greg the Hammer Valentine against Bob Backlund. Originally, Tito was supposed to have had a title match with uh, one of the Samoans, and they put me into that spot so that uh, you know Tito had a credible opponent that he could shine with. Uh, and, and for me, I wasn't wrestling full time, not anywhere near the shape I was, you know, back when I first started. And I just didn't want to go for my own one time in Madison Square Garden and. Uh, embarrass myself. So, uh, it, it, and there's tapes of that match out there, and I have a, won myself a copy. And um, you know, it, I I felt that uh, I didn't embarrass myself. But also on that card was a six man with Roddy Piper, Paul Orndorff, and Dr. D. David Schultz against Tony Atlas, Rocky Johnson, uh, and uh, Ivan Putsky. And after all these years with the tragic deaths that we've had in in, in the business, uh, all those guys are still living. And I had yeah. each of them take my program and autograph it, and I have a copy of, a, of up on the wall with a picture that uh, Tito and I uh, uh, had made together back in 2007 when I had it framed, and I had a second copy of it made that I donated to uh, the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame up in Amsterdam. I think I saw a copy of that insert on your website. Don't you have a picture of the card on there? Yes, yeah, they I do. I, I did see that because I was going to say that was a heck of a card that night, too. I mean, it's with Slaughter and the Sheik and that six-man with Piper and Orndorff and Schultz. I mean, it's it's a heck of a night to be there. But any any time, I guess, like you were saying, if, if you're in the wrestling business and yeah, I think that that's the pinnacle to be in Madison Square Garden, like you said, you know. Yeah, I mean, that, uh, uh, with over 3,000 matches, uh, you're invariably asked about, you know, was there one great match that stood out in your career? And and when I look at all the greats, I mean, I wrestled I wrestled Dick the Bruiser. I wrestled Moose Sholock. I, I wrestled El Santo from Mexico, the great legend from Mexico, I had two matches with him. You know, Giant Baba, the Destroyer. Uh, I never wrestled against Ric Flair or wrestled against uh, like Harley Race, but was tag partners with him umpteen times, either here or in Japan. So, um, w when it comes to trying to pick out a match and all the great matches that uh, the Horseman had, I, I really have to say that the match with Tito was the one that will, will always be first in my mind and not so much because of the match itself but because it was uh my dream finally coming true it was the one time that I got myself to wrestle in Madison Square Garden 
Very good. Understandable. Well, uh, we're about halfway through here, JJ. And right at this point, I do a little uh, segment with each of our guests. It's uh, kind of a lighthearted, kind of look for maybe a humorous story uh, of sorts. I call it the three R's. He, he just actually mentioned Harley Racy he teamed with. He was our guest last week, and he shined in this part. So maybe, maybe you can maybe you can. Harley has live... led in a very adventurous life, one of the toughest guys uh in the business and uh, a great, great champion too. And I spent a lot of time around Harley. Yeah. Yeah. It was a thrill to have him on as it is you as well. You know, we're all big fans of your work as well, but the, the segment that we do here, it's called the three R's and we ask our guests that their choice to choose the R's stand for a rib, a riot or a road story. And, you know, kind of a lighthearted take here halfway through the interview. If you could have a story for us. Wow, a rib, a riot, and a road story. I was I was never too much for for ribbing because my feeling always was that once you go, go down that route and 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 start that, then there's always going to be payback, <laughs> and and so you open up a can of worms. But so I kind of stayed away from the ribbing aspect. But it was actually. Uh, later on, the one that sticks out in my mind was in 1980. I, I spent the year in Kansas City working in the office, doing the matchmaking. Terry Garvin was running the towns. Uh, Bob Geigel and Pat O'Connor and, and Harley were partners in the in the promotion. And uh, like I say, Terry Garvin would run the towns, and we would run you know the regular schedule, but we would run a lot of high schools too. And one of the ribs was that a lot of times we would go to high schools. People would t- would take uh, these. We, we would we would dress in the uh, in the in the boys' locker rooms in most cases, and a lot of the kids would leave their combination locks sitting there, not locked, and somebody would take it and put it on someone's bag. You know, big ha ha. And a guy would come back from the ring, and here's a lock on his on his bag that he has no way to to get off without having to carry it around so he can get it cut off. So one night, uh, you know, I went early, and I, I think we had a battle royal that night in one of the towns that Terry Garvin ran. And, again, I didn't have the reputation for, for ribbing. And Terry Garvin had his briefcase, went in, put it down, and he was went out going out and checking something. And I, I looked up, and there was – a typical lock sitting uh, on a locker unlocked. And I don't even know what I it wasn't like I was consciously waiting for an opportunity. It just, it was there and it was nobody in the dressing room, but me, but it was just a spontaneous thing. And I picked the lock up and I went and I, I, I put it on Terry Garvin's briefcase. And of course I rode to the town with him. And that at the end of the night when the matches were over, Terry Garvin didn't say much of anything. And we're sitting in the car, and he's on the way back driving, and he is seething because, you know, he was known to, to, to rib quite a bit himself, and now somebody put the lock on him. And so now he's kind of talking out loud with me, and he said, all right, he said, somebody put the lock on my back tonight. All right, I'm going through the whole card, and I'm going to figure out who it is. And he's talking out loud. And he said, it could have been this one. It could have been this one. And he couldn't narrow it down to be convinced in his own mind who the guilty party was. And, of course, my name never even came up in the conversation. So a few days later, we go to another high school situation, and – there was a battle royal that night, and as soon as everybody's out of the locker room and in the battle royal, here comes Terry Garvin with a with a with a whole section of chain that he had bought, and he took and ran the chain through the handle of everybody's suitcase that was on the card, and then locked the two of them together, the two ends together. So all these guys come back at the end of the night, want to shower, want to go home, and everybody's bag is chained together and locked with no way to undo them. And Terry Garvin says, well, I don't know which of you son of bitches it was, but I got you whoever it was. And so it wasn't until I was retired from the business and working for Vince Jr. in in, uh, in Stanford. 
and Terry was in there in charge of the ring crews. And Terry was there with his family, and one night uh, he invited me to come over and have dinner with his family. <laughs> and this is now, oh, I was there in 80, from 89 to 96. Uh, so this is like 10 years after this incident. And we're sitting there, and we had a little bit to drink and something to eat. And I finally said, Terry, do you remember the the night with the lock on your bag? Yep. And I said, I've got a confession to make. And his jaw dropped. And he looked at me, and I said, yep, it was me. (laughs) He laughed. I laughed. And uh, that was typical of the of the kind of humorous uh, things that we did. And the only other one that I ever that I ever played around with was, and he's a wonderful, wonderful human being was Black Bart. And he was a, he was a guy that worked hard, uh, never made a fortune in the business, but was well respected, well liked. And he and Bass were teamed together as long riders, and they wore those long duster coats. And he had this the big cowboy hat that he spent good money for and he was really proud of that and and he would get upset when guys would come back from uh, bringing the gear back from the from the ringside at the beginning of the match and just you know put it in a pile and not take care of things and that would really be upsetting to him and i had a deal one night where i came what well, happened more than once uh, where i would come back and there would be his uh, his hat sitting there, and nobody would be there, and I would take and squish it down flat. And of course, he would come out, and he would and he would go ballistic. And again, another typical case because I had no no reputation of being a river, and I was the last. And he would be get so angry, but. Uh, that would be my one and a half stories of, of the R for the rib. I guess it pays off to not be known as a ribber. It would appear <laughs> no one, no one expected that because it. it's always somebody one up. You know, it's like like how did Terry get even? Terry got a section of chain and chained everybody's bag together. So what started as an as an innocent uh, ended up somebody something that the whole dressing room wanted to fight him that night because he had locked everybody's bag up. He said, I don't know which one it was, so I got all of you. <laughs> well, we're going to keep moving along here. A uh, couple of great stories there. Good to hear about that time with, managing with uh, Black Bart and Ron Bass, too. A couple of, like you said, guys that don't get mentioned that much, but, man, they were a great team back then. You so, know, and it was it was a different time in the in the business, too, because we we didn't fly around. We traveled, and we and the guys had opposite dressing rooms, the guys that – that we wrestled against, uh, we had very little contact with. We would never see them. And in a small town like Amarillo, uh, if you would go to a restaurant and see a guy that was across the ring from you, you would turn around and go somewhere else. It just was how it was in those days. And I think that had a lot to do with why the the, the fans had had more respect for us because – we we commanded that respect by not giving them any reason to disrespect us. And, uh, you know, in the middle of the night on those long trips, we would pass each other, and uh, here we would be on a lonely stretch of highway between Colorado Springs heading to Albuquerque in the middle of the night and flash the lights and pull over, and we would get out and have a beer together and a hug, and 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 nobody would ever know and, and but it was the camaraderie driving in the car where more ideas were created about things that drew tremendous amount of money and uh one of the things that was again an impromptu thing i, I one of the greats you talked to you asked me about guys that uh, i had great respect for for a year i feuded with dick murdoch because i was kind of the the spoiled rich kid from New Jersey who was looking down on the, uh, you know, the Cowboys and the Rednecks, of which Murdoch was one of them. And I never insulted the people as such because I thought that was uh, demeaning and, and, and cheap heat. But I would make it personal with Dick Murdoch to the point that the fans then knew that I indirectly was really talking about them because he was one of them. And I found that I got more heat that way. And But when you're wrestling in weekly towns and doing different things, um, and I, I had a run with Carl, with Carl Cox, 
And one night in Abilene, um, at the end of the match, I don't remember, you know, Don Slatton was a big card because he promoted that town. But whatever happened at the end of the match, uh, I was in the main event and stayed on and, and just, uh, you know, the match was over and, and you know, got my heat back by, you know, destroying the, the guy because the match didn't go my way or whatever. And here from the dressing room, I could hear the roar, and here comes Terry Funk, and he grabbed one of those big 50-gallon tin drums that was used for collecting trash, and as he comes, he heaves it over the top rope into the ring, and it bang, bang, bounces around. It comes in the ring, attacks me. He took this this big oil drum or, or what a 50 gallon drum turned it upside down over me, knocked me down, and then then stamped up and down on it till he mm-hmm. he kind of stamped it half closed with me trapped inside, and then it was full of rust and I was spitting rust and had rust up my nose for probably a week. <laughs> but after that, I had an idea, and what happened was. Uh, Carl Cox, of course, watched it, and then a few days later in Lubbock, similar thing happened. Uh, you know, at the end of the match, and here comes Carl Cox. What's he do? But he grabs the trash can and comes in the ring and basically did the same thing to me. And we were talking after. We thought, you know, what a great match that would be if we had a trash can match where instead of pinfalls and you know we're always looking for something different. What if we had a match that the only way it could end is if one put whoever puts the other in the trash can first? And that's what was the main event of Lubbock. It was Carl Cox and myself uh, in a trash can match. And, of course, it makes it a difficult match to work because pinfalls, submissions didn't mean anything. You had to beat a guy down, kind of like the concept of the ladder match, that you had to beat a guy down to be able to go up the ladder to get whatever the prize was. Only in this case, the trash can sat behind the section of ringside seats. And on that particular night, there's this big, huge trash can, and Cox went out at the beginning of intermission, and he had done the same thing to me the week before, put it on top of me and smashed it closed. And he he went out there and did an unbelievable interview where he said that, uh, you know, I was right at home in there where I belong. The only thing missing was there was no trash. And he said, tonight I'm going to put him in there. But he said, as I look back there, that thing is empty. He had those people basically police that whole arena during the intermission and pick up every piece of trash that they could find. I mean, I'm talking about dirty diapers. I'm talking about cowboys spitting tobacco juice in their cups. Uh, By the end of the intermission, that 50-gallon drum was full, overflowing, and there was about a three-foot circle around it of trash. And he he said, you know, I'm going to put him in there only tonight. He's going to be in there where he belongs with all the trash. And we ended up, you know, going out there working the match, and Carl used to do a, a brain buster. And he gave me the brain buster in the middle of the ring, which normally he probably could have pinned me under normal circumstances, but now I'm dead weight. So to end the match, he's got to, somehow get me over to the edge where he can pick me up and get me back there to put me in the trash can. <laughs> and all of this took long enough for me to be able to have enough time that it was feasible that I could recover. But he got me over towards the edge of the apron. He got on the floor, got under me, had me over his shoulder where my legs are dangling in front, my head's in the back. And of course I'm up now looking around, shaking my head, getting the cobwebs loose. And I, I could reach into my tights and took out a pair of brass knuckles, which everybody saw but Carl Cox. And as Carl Cox then set me down feast first to then pick me up in a scoop slam and into the trash, I hauled off, cold cocked him with the knuckles, scoop slammed him head first into the trash. The whole thing fell over. I picked up the trash can and dumped 50 gallons of trash on top of Carl Cox and staggered back to the dressing room. And I remember looking over my shoulder and here's Cox just sitting there with like a banana hanging off of his bald head and tobacco (laughs) juice running down his face and all the fans killer apologizing to killer that they put all that crap in there that was now all over him. (laughs) That is, that is a great story. I, I, I would love to see footage of that. Oh, but again, it was the kind of things that 
we did that we drew money and the business was fun we we you know they you know you heard the saying that you know if you love what you're doing you'll never work a day in your life and and that was true i mean the trips were long it was physically uh very demanding if i saw harley a couple of weeks ago and and harley and i are the same age but when you consider what harley did to his body all of those years and to see him struggle to be able to get around and uh we sometimes in a walker and wheelchair and he's had numerous surgeries um you know i have so much respect for harley it's painful but he is so tough that um he still gets around when i saw him a couple weeks ago he you know he looked great and sure. um it's just um pride that we the people that were in the business that gave of their bodies that every night and that that's one of the reasons that I think the horsemen uh nobody ever could have imagined that it would become as big as it became and last as long as it did but what happened was there were a group of guys who the chemistry was just there not planned but just there and every night uh, we weren't always all in the same match, and guys would go out there, and I think Arn and his acceptance speech for the uh, the WWE Hall of Famer, it might have been uh, uh, Tully that said that, you know, a guy would go out there and basically throw down the, the gauntlet and challenge the rest of us to go out and top what they had just done. And so it was a friendly competition, and the ultimate winner was the fan because they – knew that when we were on the card that they were going to see our best effort every night in every town, no matter where it was, no matter the size of the crowd. And Flair uh, would give you the same effort if it was uh, an arena with 25,000 people or if we went to somewhere where the television show didn't air that week because of a problem and there was 500 people in the arena. You would think, oh, well, here's a night where he's just going to go through the motions. But that wasn't Rick. Rick would go out there and give you the same match. And uh, that's what the fans, uh, I think, came to respect us more for because they knew that every night we went out there and gave them everything we had. Sure, sure. Well, I, you might have might have been reading my mind a little bit there because the horseman was where we were going to head next. And actually what you were just saying about throwing down the gauntlet and, uh, you know, almost challenging each other to do as good or better than than the rest of them we've had tully blanchard and we've had lex luger on and both of them spoke separately completely separately and said pretty much that same thing but wanted to wanted to start out on the horseman from uh just from what you remember back to when the horseman started uh what what was it like or or who or when was the first time that you heard of that that idea had come about that it was going to be pitched and formed with uh Ole and Arn and yourself and Tully and Rick and uh what what was your thought process on it initially you know did you think obviously like you said you couldn't imagine the heights that it was going to rise to but uh you know just where where did the idea for the horsemen come about and what were your initial thoughts on it well, it wasn't. It wasn't really an idea that that uh, had been laid out in advance. Uh, when I first went there, I I left. I'd been in Florida. Uh, one of my other dreams was to hopefully someday be a promoter too. And I went back to the Canadian Maritimes uh, ten years after I'd got my break in the business. And Eddie Graham gave me this whole library of tapes to go up there and use them as pilots to to start and. Uh, be able to formulate, you know, formulate a crew of guys to go up there, and it was a, it was a, a very, very eye-opening lesson for me that I realized that, you know, it's a talent-driven business, but you, you, you need great talent, you need people who can get the most out of talent, but you can have the greatest talent in the world and you can have the greatest uh, matches and ideas in the world and, and personal issues. But if you don't have the eyeballs on television, <clears throat> it's a numbers game. And it, it was a situation where uh, Emil Dupre had the old television time slot that we had had 10 years earlier. And um, cable was just coming into its own and had just started – <clears throat> so the television network and their 
ended up giving us a spot on the on the on the cable network, which didn't have a tenth of the audience. And Mark Lewin came up there to work. Um, Kendo Nagasaki came up to work. We had some great talent, but they're just and and a very well produced television show, but not enough people uh, were able to see it and. Uh, it was a struggle, and I finally realized that that it wasn't going to work. That I needed to leave, get out, and I had left on good graces with uh, Eddie Graham and with Dusty. And I called Dusty, and I said, you know, things just didn't work out. And I said, I've got to move on. And he said, Well, your timing couldn't have been any better. He said, I'm I've left Florida, and come Monday, I'm starting uh, in Charlotte. Um, I'm taking over the creative with Jimmy Crockett and we're going to turn that thing around and he said you were my right hand man so he said he's pack everything and he said go right direct to Charlotte I said well do I need to call Jimmy Crockett or anything he said no he said we'll get your deal taken care of somehow and he said I want you there with me and so that's what happened and I didn't really have any buddy when I first got there so it started with uh, with Ron Bass and uh, Black Bart is the Long Riders, and then there was a period of time with Buddy Landell that was actually against Flair about, you know, who was the real Nature Boy type of thing. And then uh, Baby Doll was there with uh, Tully, and there was the deal where I orchestrated the the the, the thing where uh, I got Tully away from Baby Doll and ended up, you know, Tully stayed on us and being the typical chauvinist that he is, uh, you know, sided with me and turned on Baby Doll and Dusty came to her uh, aid and here in the period of about five minutes, here was the, the perfect 10 Baby Doll who had been with Tully is now on her knees, uh, you know, wrapped around Dusty's leg and he's standing over the great protector and that's now I'm with Tully. So Flair was the world champion. Tully and Arn, uh, or I take it back, Ole and Arn were the world tag team champions. And Tully was the national champion. And he was then the only one I was managing. And we used to do two hours of TV uh, every Saturday that aired at 6.05 on TBS. And, you know, it was live to tape. It wasn't segments that were, you know, it was taped and then it aired that night. And we would fly in from wherever we were the night before, do two hours of TV, get on a plane and go somewhere and wrestle that night. And one of the weeks, I don't know, short on time or what, and somebody said, well, you guys got all the belts, just all of you go out. You know, just tell everybody where you're going to be this coming week. And that's what happened. Flair went out there with a world title belt over his shoulder. Ole and Arn went out with the with the tag belts. Tully went out with his belt, and I went with him because I managed Tully. And as the mic passed around, uh, Arn Anderson looked at the camera and he said, uh, "You people at home, take a good hard look at your screen." And he said, "We're all champions." And he said, "Never ha- in, have so few wreaked so much havoc on." everybody else and he said you'd have to go back in the history books to the four horsemen of the apocalypse and held up four fingers it was just a statement that he threw out there and the next thing you know when one of us went out there the people in the studio four horsemen four horsemen and became an interactive thing holding up four fingers and then when we went to the towns and it was probably a couple weeks before jimmy crockett said what's this four horsemen thing i keep hearing about (laughs) jimmy it's something that uh, the fans have picked up on and they're the ones that are that's where they, the seeds planted, and, and they're they're fertilizing that seed and watering it. And somebody better pay attention, and and that's where it grew from. <laughs> that is great. Now, myself and the scum, we always had a discussion as to whatever happened to Tully Blanchard Enterprises. Was it actually sold? Was it broken down? Did another company buy it out? I think I I think we became a conglomerate, and I became. <laughs> I, that's why I, when somebody says the manager of the Four Horsemen, I always correct them, say no. I was um, there had been many managers, but I was the leader of the Four Horsemen, and uh, that kind of set me apart from everybody else. And you know, and we we just. We were different. We were, we, you know, we, uh, you know, just like the video. And and what made us so unique too? A lot of times, the the people in the business who were really hot that the fans hated, the first time they got beat, 
the edge was taken off them. They were never the same. They never quite drew like they, they did before, you know, they got beat or got beat up. And there was something about us and our chemistry that we would go out there week after week and basically, you know, leave in, in pools of our own blood for the most part, but and most often would have the belts with us and get on TV and give our, our slant on what happened. And the people would say, why well, though they know they got their butts kicked, those dirty liars, I guess they need to get back in the ring and take a worse ass whooping. So, uh, we, we just, uh, we just had that knack of being able to go out there and, and it became, a little bit of a concern after a while, mainly with Rick, because he felt that, uh, you know, that Dusty's ego uh, was so strong that he enjoyed us being out there and all feeding him and feeding the bionic elbow and night after night, give, give, give. And Rick was afraid that, uh, you know, that, that we would die off because that's what we did was give, give, give. And, um, we did that video where we ambushed Dusty uh, at Crocker Promotions, and that was uh, groundbreaking too. I mean, the things like that weren't done before, and that was a one-camera shoot that was edited together, and it came over as almost a news feed. And there were people who felt that we, you know, we should have been arrested for for assault and and faced criminal charges for for what we did. And it, it, it's and if you ever look back at that. Again, it was an era where there was credibility, there was logic, there was uh, emotion. And when that thing was shot, we were waiting for Dusty to go by in his car. We all knew where the office was and where he went and what he drove. And the cameraman would, had been hired by us. You know, we, we this was a plan. We knew what we were going, what we were doing. And the idea was instead of beating up Sam Houston, Jimmy Valiant, and and going up the pecking order. Uh, for all those people, Magnum TA that surrounded Dusty, let's go and make an example of the big dog so that all the rest are going to look at him and say, oh, boy, if they do a number on him, what are they going to do to me if they ever get me alone? And that was the, the, the logical story. And the cameraman was there, and I, and I remember in the beginning, I told the cameraman, say, look, we're paying you good money to shoot this. And you have no idea what you're shooting, and you may not like what you see, but you keep that camera rolling. Are we, are we clear on that? You know, and it's yes, sir. So that explained why there was a camera there that shot the whole thing. And then when it was all said and done, um, you know, Tony Schiavone and David Crockett were appalled that this thing happened and that it was going to be shown on TV. And if it was so despicable and such a terrible thing, then logic would say well then why are they showing it on tv and that was covered by the fact that i went out there and said well you know you've got this sneer in your face and you're, you're looking down at us and you're being so judgmental why don't you tell them why you're showing it the reason you're showing it is because you have to show it because i bought the time so that explains why it you know why it's being seen and they can be <laughs> very negative about it but it accomplished what we wanted to do. And we told them why we did it. We said we were making an example of Dusty Rhodes. And it was yeah. we we got more mileage out of that. People talk people still talk about that. But but in sure. terms of us going to the arenas, it just fueled the, the, the deal for probably six months to a year after that one incident. People absolutely still talk about that. Myself and the scum included, we have a running joke. We've had it for years, is that we always watch our backs whenever we go to a gas station in the South <laughs> <laughs> for that reason alone. But, you know, in reality, that was one of the more memorable uh, attacks, if you will, as a, as kids growing up watching that on television. And you can do some, some things that are tongue-in-cheek uh, kind of slapstick comedy, but if it's, if it's done in the right way, and a perfect example of that was the Dream Date with Precious. I mean, the, Terry, uh, Rick had that program going with, uh, uh, you know, where he was, <laughs> where he was hitting on Precious, who was actually Jimmy Garvin's wife, and you know, w one of the classic programs uh, promos that Flair did was he had the 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 head mannequin out there with a wig on it, with lipstick and and kissing the mannequin, talking about what he was going to do if he ever got her out on a date. 
And then it built up to a match that uh, if he beat Jimmy Garvin or whatever it was, that uh, Precious had to agree to uh, go out with Rick on a date. And then that's the thing that we filmed in that hotel room uh, in Atlanta. And it ended up that Ronnie Garvin came in and dragged, knocked out Flair and threw me in the pool. And yes, that could be funny. And it was funny, I guess, but it was also entertaining. And it was something that it, it 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 was entertaining, funny without being ha ha funny. If you understand what I mean. <laughs> yes, absolutely, and and not the first time he got some good mileage out of Ronnie Garvin dressed in drag. <laughs> <laughs> This is Tully Blanchard, one of the original Four Horsemen. You're listening to WGD Weekly with Steve and the Scum. Okay, well, (laughs) there you have it, Steve. Uh, J.J. Dillon, part one. Can't wait to bring the listeners part two next week. But I think we can both agree that regardless of the money drawn or, uh, you know, the entertainment value, the last thing I want to wind up in a bar is uh, putting that many back and then realizing that the lady that I'm speaking with is the hands of stone, Ronnie Garvin. (laughs) <laughs> absolutely you know it's kind of funny you everybody knows at this point that i live down here in the city of atlanta i've lived here for many many years at this point and i have asked a lot of people and not a single one know who miss atlanta lively is. yeah well again i i, I would Suffice to say that, you know, I'm no stranger to putting them back until the wee hours of the night, as uh, JJ's associate once put it, stay all night and dance a little longer, I think. But uh, I, I'm definitely not interested in uh, dancing a little longer or uh, throwing the invite to the old Marriott at uh, insert town here with uh, Miss Atlanta Lively. <laughs> I guess a lesson out of all of this is, is when you get a knock on your hotel room door, look through that little peephole and see who's coming into your room because you may be in for more than you bargained. For. That's right. You might wind up on your back on that king size that you paid the extra money for with someone stopping <laughs> on each area, first of your legs, then your ribs, then each all the way out the arm, your fingers, the, the Miss Atlanta Lively stomp. <laughs> you know though jj was great we have part two coming up next week so don't forget that we're going to be able to have both of these available to you on youtube and itunes so don't forget to subscribe and uh, hit the download button we wanted to thank you for that in advance jj Dillon is uh, a great talker a great storyteller clearly well spoken and he's got a lot and i think um what what i got out of this interview so far scum is people overlook how long this man's wrestling career was and and, and where it started and when he started. He got, he was, like he mentioned, very interested in the world of professional wrestling, but it took him a little bit of time to actually get that door open to him. And he spent years refereeing for Vince Sr., which I think is a pretty unique piece of trivia because he was able to, like he said, be in the ring with guys like Pedro Morales, Bruno San Martino, Ivan Koloff, and learn the business from the inside out before ever stepping into the squared circle to be a performer and then put in 3,000 plus matches in his career. So just an amazing storyteller and a very well-rounded career from J- from James J. Dillon. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the term is thrown around at, at, at nauseum almost. Uh paying one's dues yeah Uh, i think jj Dillon can say that he went from uh you know the leader of a fan club the president of a fan club in wrestling to a referee to in the ring with with guys like you said bruno killer kowalski uh you know just legends guys that are you know when when you talk baseball and you talk guys that almost seem non-existent almost like a you know uh folklore like a babe ruth i mean you're talking bruno san martino killer kowalski guys like that he had the chance to be in the ring and span all of those generations to where he became a manager and managed guys like abdullah the butcher and obviously the four horsemen you know tully blanchard prior to the four horsemen which led to that to where he you know went went backstage and worked on the other side of the coin and worked with guys throughout the you know mid 90s the brad hartz and the Shawn michaels and the you know back to nitro where he worked the nwo and those are i mean just a guy who has literally spanned the gauntlet of wrestling history and it doesn't appear as though he's forgotten one second of that journey no no absolutely not and he's a fan of the sport and i think that's very important when we're talking to guys and we're referring to the glory days of wrestling 
uh, the differences really uh, from today's product and some of the performers that, uh, you know, may or may not be there just for the paycheck. There was a passion and a love and a dedication that some of these older performers had. And, and I hope that it doesn't get lost as, as the generations grow and, and we keep watching wrestling as we get older and, and the performers are, you know, like they, like that uh, Matthew McConaughey from, uh, from days to confuse. Yeah. We watch these wrestlers and, and I get older, but they stay the same age. I hope that, they have that appreciation and respect as fans, and I know a lot of them do, but it's just so great to hear a guy that spent his whole adult life being involved in the wrestling business, and like you said, paying his dues. He reminds me of Dallas Page in a sense that he was on the fringe of the business for quite a long time, but really didn't get into being a performer until kind of a later age, and I know that's a lot more difficult, so there can be a little bit more appreciation for a man's career in that aspect than it would be to just simply come out of, uh, you know, playing college football, going to the gym. And the next thing you know, uh, you get into the wrestling business and that's no knock against guys like Ron Simmons and Wahoo McDaniel, Manny Fernandez, because that's a totally different time frame and a different era. And those boys paid their dues worse than anybody could imagine. I'm sure. But I guess what I'm referring to is guys that has spent their whole lives dedicated to the sport because they're fans and they were very successful once they got into the business. Yeah, Steve, I, I'm always just flabbergasted with the guests that we get on. Like you said, the guys who, uh, who again, maybe it, it went from, uh, you know, humble beginnings where they were on the fringe, like you said, and worked their way through the business. But even more so, the guys, we've had a few of them. I, the first one, I think, that really hit home that we had on the program that I was like, holy cow, this guy, you know, how long, was when we first way back when talked to Bushwhacker Luke, I believe we called it our uh, hardcore double play there. Yeah. And then uh, when Ivan Koloff and some of these guys, and Jimmy Valiant, the guys that we spoke with, that they span those generations and generations. Yeah, we know them. We knew them most in that 80s era that we came up and that was so great that made us such big fans but when you hear the names that are spit out along the way and all the paths that were crossed and then you almost forget that they were also there in those later years and in the boom in the late 90s and into 2000 and they're still in some capacity involved you know it, it always blows my mind to hear these stories from these guys as a fan that the things that i mean everybody's heard you know certain things and everybody remembers you know jj putting up the four fingers and doing some of the things you know that he talked about that throughout the interview you know in his later years but though though the early and i think he said that he kept the journal as he yeah, went along yeah. throughout the whole thing and uh it's just incredible stuff i know brett hart when he wrote his book similarly used to keep like a log as he went you know town to town which is why they can be so date specific and um i'm sure jim Cornette the same way with the books that he's written but uh just always what, what a treat it is for us as fans which we you know which we first and foremost we always have no problem huge wrestling fans to hear such a timeline and to hear the, the the events as they you know progress through and all the stops along the way and everywhere that he'd been and the tours of japan and you know the different territories just incredible i mean to me i I could listen to it. I hope that you as our listeners, I hope Scum Nation appreciates it. And I think that you do as much as we do when, when we take a walk down memory lane with someone like J.J. Dillon. Oh, yeah, of course. And, and how well-rounded and, and what can one individual be in the business? I mean, 10 years of refereeing, 3,000-plus matches as a performer, managed prob or I'm sorry, led, I'm sure it can arguably be the biggest, most popular faction of all time in the Four Horsemen spent time as the onstage authority figure in the Attitude Era and the Monday Night Wars on Nitro, and sat backstage with Vince McMahon and helped design television. Now, I watched very few of the kayfabe commentary shoots, but he did one where he talked about how WWE went about producing their weekly program. And to me, in retrospect, after having watched that, it really laid out the, uh, the map or the framework as to how WWE put their stuff on television and it all made sense. So not only is he a great storyteller, a fan, he is probably one of the most well-rounded individuals ever in the history of pro wrestling. I mean, it, it, you'd have to be for what he's done. It's just amazing to wear so many hats and be so successful at, at the same time. So to me, JJ Dillon, uh, very underrated as where his spot is in the history of wrestling 
extremely happy that he carries the ring of being a WWE Hall of Famer. If he hasn't mentioned it already, he'll get into this of being a member of multiple Halls of Fame. And, and I think that's, some, you know, again, a testimonial to his lifelong work in the business. Absolutely. And and again, as we move into part two, a really interesting one point that, um, you know, we were both just talking about the refereeing and the, you know, his, his work with, with the television, like you said, that guest booker where he uh, maps out how they write television and stuff, you know, really incredible stuff. Just really cool to see as a fan that, that side exposed. He also at one point, and again, I forgot when I had mentioned his, the gauntlet, I mean, don't forget part of when he was at WWF, he was the head of talent relations prior to Jim yeah, Ross. Yeah. So not only that, he also worked in that capacity with the talent. Not not only as, you know, obviously he's written television. Obviously he's been on screen as a manager. He's been on screen as a wrestler. He's been on screen for a referee. He's also dealt in the business aspect of it, you know, where there's dollars and cents being talked. So, I mean, what the, 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 just an extremely intelligent man, an extremely humble man. And through everything, I think the one thing that yourself, Steve, and, and I – have in common with JJ is just an enormous wrestling fan. I mean, through it all yeah, still to yeah. the day, the guy, he loves it more. I mean, we come on some, we, we, a lot of times don't know, you know, but the time frame that someone is going to have, I mean, the reason you're looking at a part two interview, wasn't something that we asked him. He was more than happy to spend that much time and revisit, you know, all points of his career and, and thoroughly, you know, spoke with us afterwards off the air about how much he enjoyed doing so. So I, uh, again, I can't say enough about JJ Dillon. I can't wait to bring you all part two of this interview because it's just as entertaining. It's, you, you know, there's just as many things that maybe you didn't remember, or maybe you never knew about coming from JJ. So again, part one, fantastic, you know, in the books, be sure and tune in next week to part two and moving forward, as we said, with all the great, I mean, things are happening really fast here at uh wrestling's glory days weekly. And, uh, we're pretty excited about it. And just like, we'll be excited to bring you more JJ next week. Absolutely, scum. And I'll tell you, man, next week is going to be a great wrap up to the J.J. Dillon interview. Another hour and 15 minutes of J.J. Stephen the Scum. We also have a very, very special guest. We're going to talk about his new movie coming out, too. So, Scum, talk to us a little bit about who else we have on tap for next week. A special surprise and uh, a humbling experience. <laughs> humbling, to say the least, Steve. Uh, who we Next week, what we, not only will we be bringing you part two of J.J. Dillon, uh, we'll also, very special, uh, the recently released, we spoke with just before it was released, we spoke with the WWE Hall of Famer, former WWF champion, and social media god, as he's <laughs> been reborn on Twitter and with some of the outlandish statements that he's had to make about many people across the wrestling landscape but uh immediately before, prior to the release of his documentary uh the chic the movie we had a chance to speak for about 10 15 minutes with the iron chic and his management as well who were uh nice enough to help us secure that spot for the show so to, before we bring you part two next week of james j Dillon, we are going to have the legendary iron chic that's right chicy baby will be here on wrestling's glory days weekly next week making an even more can't miss show prior to the jj interview and i believe if i could speak on behalf of the chic uh, i don't think he lets many people speak for him other than uh at one point when he ran under the name mustafa our old friend general and Don used to do some speaking for him. But if I could bring you some talk on behalf of the Sheik in English that you might understand, um, you'd better listen next week or the Sheik will come find you, put you in the camel clutch, and how does he say it, Steve? Humble you and break your back. Absolutely right. He's the only person on earth I know that can tell Sesame Street's Elmo to go fuck himself with a straight face. That, so that's right. Cannot wait for the Iron Sheet. You never know if you're going to hear about Brian Blair, about Hulk Hogan, about the Ultimate Warrior, or about the Miley Cyrus or the Justin Bieber. Oh, totally, totally. You know, he he does speak on The Rock and a few other performers uh, that do have some. Um, small parts in his movie so stay tuned for that the iron chic like you've never heard him before right here on steven the scum with wgd weekly scum that's it for me my brother we're gonna roll on out of here any last words before we tell the folks to tune in next week like we do already i got one 
at WGD Weekly. We're at 477 followers. I want 500 followers before the end of the season. 23 people, that's not asking for very much. Spread the word out there, at WGD Weekly on Twitter. Give us a look and and hit the like button on Facebook, WGD Weekly Facebook page. We're all over the place. We've been there for a year. It's about time people started paying attention. I don't know, Scum. I'll tell you what. I'm going to get back to work in that office with all the hot irons and the furnace. I'm going to put my gloves on and my apron and my goggles. I'm going to start hammering out some more irons in the fire. I, it sounds like a plan, my friend. I, the last, before we go, I just want to say thanks to everybody out there in Scum Nation. Thanks to the WGD faithful for, uh, you know, sticking with us here in, in, in our absence. But like I said, you don't want to miss these last five shows. Big developments. We got Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. We got the Russian Nightmare Nikita Koloff. We have Kevin Sullivan and Jim Cornette together for our one-year anniversary program that you do not want to miss. The first time that those two have been in the same interview, maybe ever, but the first time they've spoken with one another in years. Old friends. That, I mean, if you've seen Cornette, he wears the I'm Your Booker Man t-shirt on his You Shoot interviews with uh, kayfabe commentaries old friends reunited by steven the scum a dynamite episode we also have some big news that each week we're going to be kind of you know as as we're allowed fill you in a little more on a new member of the team us joining up with this person for season three it's going to be a whole new landscape we also have some news to begin dropping on you about a venture with uh, wgd weekly with steven the scum entering the world of video shoot interviews as well that's something that we haven't mentioned. So there's huge stuff coming up. We appreciate you bearing with us. Uh, we, Without you listening in, none of this is possible. So we can't thank you enough. Uh, be sure and tune in next week. The Iron Sheik and Part 2 of James J. Dillon. That's all I have for you for this week. Uh, other than, unless Steve has something else, we'll see you then, my friends. I'm done. A little disappointed I didn't get a Cobra in my wedding gifts. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, that that's that's been that that's been done, but he was right down the road. We should have been, we should have invited Roberts. I did. <laughs> uh, was was that was that him playing the acoustic with his sandals on singing brown eyed girl? <laughs> I'm not sure if it was him or Dale Earnhardt. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, my, may have been Fogarty. I, I, an, another story for another time, people. But we're running out of airtime here, and like we said, WGD faithful scum nation. Until next week, we'll see you soon. Still bummed out about the no coker thing.